want to talk to you just briefly tonight on six keys to cultivating great faith. I don't know that we'll get through all six, but we'll do our best. Power and the baptism in the Holy Spirit go hand in hand. If we want to see a demonstration of the Spirit's power in our life at an unusual level, then we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to just mention this. It has something to do with the message, but I've been asked several times by people who have been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit why they have not yet received. And some are getting discouraged, and some maybe have been a bit ambivalent in seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to assure you, as, we, as we're going to see when we move through the book of Acts, it is something that the early church viewed as absolutely essential, and it is the key to experiencing the power of God. The more you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to see signs and wonders happen in a church and among a group of people. And we've had many, many people feel, uh, for example, Jack sent this testimony in after attending my third Stronger Men's Conference this past weekend and standing with my hands raised in worship at the 1045 service, the Holy Spirit filled my heart, mind, and soul for the first time in my life. The warmth of the presence of the Holy Spirit permeated throughout my body from my head to my toes. I started speaking in tongues, praising the glory of God with every breath I took. I've waited 42 years seeking that very moment in my life. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? All that to say it could happen in a worship service. But I've had people who've asked, why haven't I received? And, and some have wondered, well, does that mean it's not for me if I haven't received yet? Here's Jack. He's waited 42 years, and I'm not suggesting that anybody has to wait 42 years, but if you'd ask Jack, was it worth waiting 42 years, Jack would say absolutely. Yeah. Let me just give you some things to consider, and, and you know, maybe you're filled, and this will help you as you talk to people. Maybe you have not yet been filled. This should encourage you um, for the most part. Sometimes I think we have to do a little bit of diagnostic testing. I talked uh, a couple weeks ago about how when things don't work like we thought, then we need to go to Jesus and ask him why, right? That's what the disciples did. They said, Jesus, why couldn't we heal that person? And Jesus right away told them. You know, I would say this. I'm going to give you just a, a general list. There are some people who don't receive, and part of the reason is because they are just standing there quietly or sitting there quietly and expecting God to do something for them that they're not even doing for themselves. So there's a sense where you and I and all that we do are cooperating with God, we're participating with God, and when we're seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is not a quiet endeavor. If you want to speak in a spiritual language, you have to speak. So there are people who, when you pray for them, they're just sitting there quietly like God is going to grab their tongue and shake it. It's not going to happen. I've never seen it happen. I would suggest it is, it is helpful when people pursue God with all that is in within them. I'm talking about physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. That upraised hands are a way to accomplish victory. We've talked about that. There's a victory that comes when people raise their hands. There's also a sense of surrender to the Lord that I think is essential when it comes to receiving the baptism. Get your hands in the air and bless the Lord, right? I mean, you want to receive and then begin to speak. There's something about my physical being being involved and my soul being involved in blessing the Lord and vocalizing my praise to the Lord. And as I'm doing that, all within me, seeking all that he has for me. I think second, there, there sometimes people approach it in a bit of an ambivalent manner. By that, I mean, they're like, well, you know, if God's got something for me, I want it. But if he doesn't, I guess I, I'm okay. I'm not saying a person couldn't receive that way. I'm just saying that this gift is pers worth pursuing with all that's within you. And if you're ambivalent and you're like, man, it'd be great if I had it, but I'm doing great if I don't get it. You're immediately positioning yourself to not see God with all that's within you. 
There's something about saying, God, you promised this, I need it, and I want it, and with my whole soul, I'm focused on you till I get it. For some, I would suggest this, that before God pours his power in you, he wants to do a work on you. I think, I think this is many times what happens. For example, you can take the apostles. He's got to do a work in that group of people before he puts that amount of power in them or the power will collapse them. It takes a steady hand to carry a full cup. It takes a cistern that can hold the water before you put it in. And for some, I would suggest the work God is going to do in you is so powerful, he has to ready you for it. And a part of that readying you for it is the process of you waiting on him and spending time with him. There's something that happens in that moment. For some, it's a matter of learning to respond in faith because there is a sense where he's giving it, but we're taking it. We've talked about that. He's giving, we're receiving. He's prompting, we're responding. Can I just suggest to you that when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then all the gifts of the Spirit that come as a result of that, that that's how that works. The Lord prompts you, but you have to take the step of faith. You have to be able to hear the voice of God, respond to the voice of God in the faith that will result in God's work in your life. So he is teaching you how to respond to the moving of his spirit. And there is a, even a preparation that happens in that. There are some, and I would suggest, and, and again, uh, you know, I'm not shooting at anybody. I'm just trying to help people process through some things that could be a reality. And I've read enough testimonies now to believe that this is a reality for a lot of people where you've possibly had a uh, bad teaching, unbiblical teaching, not complete Bible teaching, and you've held on to that. And there comes a place where there is a repentance. She says, it's not my fault. I didn't, they taught me. I didn't know. But there is an acknowledgement that once you recognize an error in your thinking or your theology, that you repent of that and you say, Lord, I thought this. Obviously, I can see from your word that what I thought is not correct. And I repent of the error in my thinking because I don't want anything to stand between me and what you want to do in my life. So let me give you, an, not give you an example from my own personal life. So, you know, I've, I've never been opposed to people being slain in the spirit. It's never, it's never, I've never been opposed. But at the same time, I've, I've reacted to what I saw as an abuse of that. So you weren't really sure if people were being pushed or people were actually falling. And in light of that, I have personally formed some opinions and I have said some things that in this season, as I've, as I've you know, studied revivals and seen what God has done through time, I've really become convicted that some of what I've held to be true, um, I was in my own ignorance speaking or formulating opinion. And I've simply said, Lord, I don't ever want to miss out on one thing you want to do in my life. And Lord, I realize that some of the attitudes and some of the things that I have felt in my heart or expressed with my mouth have been incorrect. And I'm asking you to forgive me because I don't want anything less than all that you have for me, whatever that is, right? I just think sometimes there's a place for saying, you know what? I spoke of things I did not understand. And now, God, I'm asking you to forgive me because I want my heart. I want all that you have for me. And I don't want anything in my heart that would prevent, diminish, or preclude your, your outpouring in my life to whatever degree you want to do it. I think another thing that has, that has not helped some people is they come forward to receive or they spend time seeking. And then when they're not Fill with the Spirit in that moment, they walk out, and here's what they say, I didn't get it. I didn't get it again. 
I didn't get it. And I would suggest to you that just like with healing, I would, I would tell people, and in my own experience and journey uh, of healing, whenever I would come forward for prayer, I never walked away saying I didn't get it. I always walked away saying God is at work. That I think there's something about embracing the perspective of faith that says, when I begin to pray, God begins to answer. One of the pioneers in Pentecost, Donald G., wrote of coming forward and, and being prayed for and not experiencing anything but going home with joy in his heart because he knew God was going to answer the prayer that had been prayed over him. And that faith and that anticipation that says, listen, I know God is at work now, and I know even right now because I've asked, he's filling me now. I just haven't yet experienced the overflow. And so I think there's a place for us to walk in faith and believe God's going to answer our prayers, whatever, whether it's healing. The worst thing you could do is, if you need healing, is to walk out and say, well, you didn't heal me because how do you know you're not going to walk out in the parking lot and be healed? How do you know you're not going to get up on Monday morning and be healed? How do you know you're not going to be like Naomi and have the doctor come back and say, you're healed? I mean, how do you know that God isn't at work in your body right now? And I think when we speak words of doubt, we empower doubt in our life. And so just something to think about as we, I would say this, the baptism, Peter's clear, it's for you and all who are far off. It's for everyone. It's for you. Settle that in your heart. Uh, take what I'm saying and embrace it and use it to uh, go forward in faith, believing God's going to help you. Amen? Amen? Well, just quickly, I want to talk to you about six keys to cultivating great faith. And maybe at the outset, it's helpful to realize that when it comes to faith, uh, I think there are three categories of faith. The first one would be saving faith. Uh, Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. So the work of God, that, in fact, I would suggest to you that faith is always the gift of God in whatever dimension. If it's saving faith, none of us could believe in him unless he gave us the faith to believe, and that's what it's saying in Ephesians. The work of grace in our life is that he, he gives us faith that when we act on it, it activates it and it grows in our life, right? So there's saving faith, then there's serving faith, faith to serve. In Romans chapter 12, Paul is talking about gifts, and I think it's unwise to see these as gifts of the Spirit. They are a work of God in our life, but they are not charismata like we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's, there's a different word used for them because they are different in their function. Are they from the Lord? Yes, but it, is, it involves us in serving. So Paul says, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. In other words, it's not humility to run around and say, I'm, I'm no good and I can't do anything and I have no talents. Not true, and that insults God. You're a child of God. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he ordained in advance for you to do, Ephesians 2.10, right? So you are uniquely, wonderfully gifted. And here's the exciting thing about walking with Christ. You don't know the gifts that are in you. You know some, but you don't know all. And it's only as you walk with him that you'll see God bring to fruition the gifts he's placed in you. I believe in my own life there are still things I'm not aware God has placed in me that I will yet see in my walk in service of Christ. That's the faith God has given us. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. He's given you faith to serve. So there are in this list, there are gifts of leadership and administration. There's gifts of giving. And that takes faith that God gives you to be, to function in the gift of giving. Are you with me on that? So there's faith for salvation, there's faith for serving, and then number three, there's supernatural faith. 
1 Corinthians 12, 9, the same Spirit gives us, talking about the gifts of the Spirit, great faith, mega faith, to another. So there are supernatural, there's a supernatural gift of faith where God breathes in us, places in us by the Spirit, the faith to believe him for things that would be impossible. So that you, in that moment, know in your knower, that you know inside. You have this confidence you can't explain, you just know. You just know it's there. You just have a, an experience with the Lord. So that's the first way to cultivate great faith, be filled with the Spirit. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And then it talks about some have the message of wisdom and another has the message of knowledge and another faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. So when you are and I are filled with the Spirit, what's gonna happen is we are more often, more readily, gonna be empowered by the Spirit of God to believe God for extraordinary things that bring about a supernatural answer to our prayers. Are you with me? So we too readily can get caught up in evaluating, do I have enough faith? Which I would suggest to you, even as we talk about cultivating great faith, it is, a, it is not helpful for you to evaluate the level of your faith because I think sometimes we really don't know what the level of our faith is. And it doesn't take a lot of faith if it's real faith. So we may think we need way more than we need when really all we need is a mustard seed if it's the real thing and we can move a mountain. But that faith comes from the Lord. We've got to be filled with the Spirit. Number two, time in God's presence. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 16, this is the story of the boy who's epileptic, demonized as well. His father brings his son to the disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus replied, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Who is he talking about? I think he, in part, is talking about the disciples because they tried to heal him and could not. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. It's a very interesting thing to realize that they were standing around. They, when the father brought the son, they were like, oh, we've cast out demons before. We're going to be able to do this. So they think they can do it. They've done it before, and they try to do it. They believe they could. Believing you can and having the faith necessary to do it are two different things. This is, a, this is a bit of a mystery. Yeah. Jesus says to them, you had too little faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What is he saying? There's a connection there between faith and prayer. The more time we spend with God, the more understanding we're going to have of the voice of God, the work of God, the power of God functioning in our life. Had they spent more time with the Father, when Jesus was spending time with the Father, Jesus is indicating they would have been able to do what they couldn't do. There are some things and sometimes that we will only have faith as our prayer life grows. This is why as we talk about moving into a season of seeing God do greater and greater things, something that should happen in our heart is there should be a desire in our life to spend more time with the Lord. 
Because if we're going to see God do more than we've ever seen him do, a part of it is going to be in response to what we see around us, and it certainly builds our faith to believe God can do some things, but if we want to command the power of God, we've got to spend time in the presence of God. And this is what Jesus is saying. And the idea of coupling it with fasting, fasting is a path to power, but the power comes from God. Fasting simply says I'm setting aside time to give undivided focus to the Lord. Again, time with God results in greater faith. Number three, obey God. You and I can obey our way to great faith. Luke chapter 17, I love this passage. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. I love Jesus' answer. Well, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted the sea, and it'll obey you. You know what he's doing here? Lord, I just need you to increase my faith. And Jesus is saying, let's not make this too complicated. You don't need a lot of faith if you have real faith. A mustard seed's just like a little tiny speck. You only need a little speck of faith if it's real faith, and if it is, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now I want you to notice what Jesus does right on the heels of that. Look at what he says. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Now, here's the lesson in that. He's saying, when you're a a servant and you have a master, you do what the master tells you. It's expected that you would. He makes the application in verse 10, and this has everything to do with faith. So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say, we're unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. When you've done everything you were told to do, Jesus is making the connection. The disciples are saying, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus is saying, just do what you're told to do, and you'll find your faith is bigger than you thought. Yesterday, I, was, I did two radio call-in programs talking about uh, an issue that is on the horizon in the community. And, and as I was praying and just asking the Lord, you know, really to, to give me a, a gentleness uh, in talking about it and to give me favor with people who were hearing it, just that's what I was praying about. I wasn't thinking about anything else. The Lord put in my heart, when you are in the studio, you will see somebody who visibly needs healing. Pray for them, and I will heal them. Wow. It's very interesting to me. I was like, wow. So I go to the first one at 7 o'clock, and there is nobody there but the DJ, and, and uh, he was very healthy. So, <laughs> so, you know, I'm done with that, and I go later in the day to the next studio, and again, I'm sitting outside waiting to go in. I have my time on the air. I walk out, and there's a man, and he's got patches on his eye, and so I go up, and I say hi to him, and then I say, hey, what happened to your eye? And he begins to explain to me his situation, says, hey, it's really a mess, and blah, 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 blah. I said, well, you know what? Uh, I would like to pray for you for your eye to be healed so you don't need surgery this week. And he was like, oh. I said, can we do that? Yeah, sure. So I prayed for him right then, and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call the church and tell me what happened after your appointment on Friday. So I'm so excited to hear. But you know, the Lord will speak to us, but it's a matter of obeying. Listen, it's not a matter in that moment of, do I have the faith to heal him? The issue is, do I have the willingness to obey God? And you know, sometimes when I've just prayed for people, I didn't feel any great faith, only later to find out that I had the faith, apparently in the prayer of obedience, to see healing happen in their life. Listen, it's a dead-end street to try to evaluate how strong your faith is. You can't do it, the disciples couldn't do it, so that's not the issue. Obey God, right? Whatever he tells you to do, 
Well, number four. Hey, I'm, making, I'm making really good progress. We're going to get through this thing. <laughs> Recognize Jesus' authority. You know, sometimes we don't understand the scope, the scale, the enormity of the authority of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home. He's a young boy, paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. How can this guy say this? For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go and he goes. That one, come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. In other words, what he's saying is, I am a person of authority and I recognize you have authority relative to sickness. And so just like I understand that the scope of my authority, I understand the scope of your authority. And if you just say the word that my servant's gonna be healed, he'll be healed. Jesus' response to that is when he heard this, he was astonished and said to those following, I tell you the truth, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith, with such mega faith. Great faith occurs when we recognize the authority and the scale of authority that Jesus Christ has. How much authority does Jesus have? That's right, it's not a trick question. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came to them and said, Okay, I got the front row with me. I'd love to hear the stadium. Jesus came and said, Oh, beautiful. Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then what does he say? Now, therefore, go. He says, I have authority. I'm giving my authority to you. To exercise authority. Colossians 1, beautiful example of how much authority he has. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. So these are angelic beings. He created every single thing we see and cannot see, every being. He's before all things and in him, all things hold together. Listen, if he has that kind of power, that kind of control, that kind of authority, then don't you think if he sends you out and you say in Jesus' name, it's going to happen? Absolutely it is. We have to remember his authority. He is before all things. He is above all things. All things were created by him and for him. And in his name, there is power and authority. So if Jesus says, John chapter 14, you can ask me for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Father can bring glory, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Jesus says, you can ask me for anything and I'll do it. Here's the immediate thing people do. Is that really true? Jesus says, yes, it is. I love that in the NLT. Some of you, you kind of let the rain kind of put you in a nappy kind of. Come on. Yes. Ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And he says that as we've seen five times in that discourse. Five times. Why does he have to say it five times? Because we don't believe it the first time. We sure don't believe it the second time. He's got to say it five times. And still you have a lot of people who are saying, well, you know, except. No, Jesus says, is it true? Yes, it is true. He has all authority. Number five, understand the grace of Jesus. What is grace? Grace, and I mean, there's many wonderful definitions. I'm going to give you a very simple one. God giving us what we don't deserve. See, a lot of people, they feel like, well, I don't know whether I deserve it. I don't know whether I deserve to have God heal me. I don't know whether I deserve to have God answer my prayer. I don't know if I deserve to have God use me. Listen, it's not about 
any part of our Christianity is not about what we deserve. It's about how good he is. It's about how kind he is. It's about how much he loves to do for us. The psalmist said, you're good and you do good. Mark 27 and verse 25, story of the Canaanite woman. Right away, a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit. and She begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile born in Syrian Phoenicia, Jesus told her, first, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. You say, you say what in the world? Listen, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is conversing with her to draw from her the kind of faith that will result in the healing of her daughter. Sometimes Jesus works with us in different ways to elicit from us the faith that will bring about the answer to our prayers and our need. She replied, I love this. You say, well, isn't that offensive? She is not offended. She replied, well, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs eat, even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. Here's what she's saying. Jesus, there is so much, you have so much, that even if you just gave me a scrap of your power, it'd heal my daughter. I don't need a whole lot of your power. I just need a little bit. And I know you have so much you could spare that much for me. That's what she's saying. Here's what he says. Good answer. Good answer. That's a good answer. Now go home. The demon has left your daughter. Matthew puts it this way. When she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. Jesus answered the woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Her daughter was healed from that very hour. Great faith came. Why? When she realized the graciousness of Jesus and the immensity of his power. That even if it's just a little bit of power, it's enough to do whatever she needed. The smallest bit of God's power is enough to heal you, is enough to meet your need, is enough to help you in whatever situation you're in. He's that powerful. He can do it. One last thing. Live close to Jesus. Live close to Jesus. You know, it'd be a shame if going through this season in the life of the church, if after We've been at this now for a year. If today you're not closer to Jesus than you were a year ago. To have a move of God where we're seeing people saved, where obviously unsaved people are sensing the presence and the power of God in a life-changing way. And where people are being healed. I mean, I, the list of people is, is enormous and the miracles are exceptional. And they're only increasing in intensity, in volume, the things that God is doing. And something should happen to us. It should, if, if you're a spectator, you sit back and applaud and then go on about your business. If you enter into what he's doing in a place, then it makes you say, oh God, you're in this place. And I just want to grow deeper in you and grow closer to you. John 15, 7, Jesus said, but if you remain in me, what does that mean, remain in me? It's the Greek word meno. It means if you stay in me, if you live or dwell in me, if you continue in me, if you tarry, if you wait on me, if you're around me, if you're with me, if you're close to me. Look at the rest of that verse. And my words remain in you. In other words, you're not only close to him, but his words are close to your heart. I want to ask you this. Have any of the scriptures you've heard in this last year that have have really impacted the church? Have they impacted your life to such a sense that 
you've really gone back and said, Lord, just make it so much a part of my life that it's what I really think about. It's how I function. Is there any verse that you've, that you've heard quoted again and again, and now you find yourself quoting it because you put the word of God in your heart? Listen, I, here's, here's what God, the Lord wants to do. He wants to take what's happening in here and take it out there. Because if it only happens in here, it will die in here. This is, I mean, that is not only a truth, that's a warning to every single one of us. If we can only pray for people in this room, something's wrong. Because the power is given to display the love, the grace, the goodness, the reality of God to a world that does not know him. And that world, some of them will make it in here. Most of them will not. That's why we have to go outside and we have to take it to them. But unless you're living in the Lord, unless you're walking with the Lord, unless you're thinking about his word, unless you're spending time in his presence, you're not going to do that. And I'm just simply saying God wants to use everybody in this room as a minister of his grace and his glory to the world around them, wherever that world is, your neighborhood, your job, your, the, the places where you do business, the places where you go, even on vacation. And when he pours out his spirit, it's for the purpose of reaching the lost. Honestly, that's what it's about. And that's what we're seeing. But God wants, God wants you to get as close to him as you possibly can. And when you do that, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. I close with this scripture, Mark chapter 11. Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. Really, it could be rendered, have the faith of God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. Would you notice we heard that in Luke 17? We heard it in Matthew 17. We're hearing it in Mark 11. And the context is different in all of those. What's this tell you? This is a favorite saying of Jesus. This is something he taught a lot. If you listened to him very long, you would hear him use this illustration because this is really important to your development and my development. May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. It will happen, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. And that's faith like a mustard seed. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Right now, the Lord wants to work in this place. He wants to show his power. He wants you and I to walk in the reality of great faith. And really, it's not about you and I trying to work ourselves up to something. It's you and I just walking close to Jesus and letting the things we've just talked about become a reality in our life. Amen. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we want to let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.